Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Terry Godwitz, and I'm with the Center for Global Education, and I could not be more thrilled to be connecting with you all across Canada from coast to coast. We're coming together from British Columbia to New Brunswick to talk to our Canada's astronaut, David Sejac, who is not coast to coast at this moment. He is uh, across uh, uh, the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. I'm not sure which one would be closer to get to you to tell you. I'm on the other side of the planet. Oh, the, uh, that's exactly it. Still, we, but we are sharing the Northern Hemisphere. So that's a good side to, to think of it that way. So ladies and gentlemen, we could not be more thrilled uh, to, to have everybody here. Um, we're going to be saying hello. Let's find out who our students are um, here in a second. First, we're gonna say hello to our hosts who have made this event happen over at Beakerhead. We're gonna go across to them who are joining us in Southern Alberta, in Calgary, uh, live from Robert Thirst School. And after we hear from Beakerhead, uh, we're going to then be starting for our students out in British Columbia, then to Alberta, then to Ontario, then to New Brunswick to say a really quick hello. But before we do that, we would like to pop on down and say hello and have a greeting from our friends at Beakerhead who are joining us from their school uh, that they're joining us in Calgary, Robert Thirst School. So over to our friends at Beakerhead. Go ahead, Beakerhead. Hi, this is Carolyn from Robert Thurs High School coming to you from Calgary, Alberta. I just want to thank you all for joining us today and a big thank you to our uh, sponsors, uh, Government of Alberta and Cirque and Axia for bringing this to you today. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Robert Thurs and thanks, uh, Beaker Head. So let's see meet our students. Now we have many, many, many more students who are joining us uh, through YouTube, through the channel that's happening there. Um, but we have four interactive schools. Uh, who are going to be joining us from across Canada. So let's start with our friends in Vancouver. Hello, Vancouver. Oh, there we are. Here we go. I'm going to unmute you. Let's try that one more time. Hello, Vancouver. What? Excellent. Good job, Vancouver. Okay, we're going to go back to our friends who are joining us down south in southern Alberta at Robert Thirst. Let's hear hello from Robert Thirst. Ready, Robert Thirst. Hello in Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Okay, now we're going to go across to our friends who are joining us in New Brunswick. Hello, New Brunswick. Oh, hi, hi, how are you? Hey, well done, New Brunswick. And last but not least, we're going to say hello to our friends who are joining us in Ontario. Hello, Ontario. <laughs> Look at that. David, could we? <laughs> this is awesome. You know, how many times do we get together as a country? Not very often. I don't think there's a better reason for us to get together than to celebrate science, to celebrate space, and to celebrate the work that amazing Canadians are doing. So well, let's go across and say hello to our, our, one of our amazing Canadians, uh, David Saint-Jacques, who actually is from Quebec. Uh, a background, I'm reading over this, the things that you have done, an engineer, an astrophysicist, a family doctor, um that's that's pretty impressive and then again being an astronaut is you have to be pretty impressive to get there uh well, i'll pass the microphone over to you to tell us a little bit more about uh about what it means to be an astronaut and uh and and why you're joining us here today robert thirst over to uh, not robert thirst uh former astronaut but uh david sejac over to you go ahead rob thirst is my hero so i'll take it as a compliment Thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to talk to uh, young Canadians. Young Canadians are our future, of course. You are our future. And uh, I, I'm going to, it's my joy to let you know a little bit of what I'm doing here. So you can't tell here because this is this white room, but I'm in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. That's where the uh, Russian Federation operates uh, a spaceport, the Cosmodrome, it's called. This is where Yuri Gagarin launched uh, several decades ago. And this is where every Soyuz rocket has launched from ever since. Uh, this is where Chris Hadfield launched from. This is where Bob Thirsk launched from. And so right now I'm here because I'm in quarantine. I am uh, slated to launch to space in a couple of months in December, near Christmas, December 20th. Touch wood. Uh, but I'm here as the backup crew because you're always ready six months ahead, backing up the crew who's launching before you. If someone falls sick or has a problem, then I might go on June 6th. I hope not for my friends. I hope they go, but I'm here because in principle I could. And this is how we run this business. You know, in the space world, 
there's always a backup computer, a backup engine, a backup everything. Well, there's also backup astronauts. Brilliant. So uh, when you go now, uh, uh, David, we have some questions that students are going to be asking from all across Canada. And um, so we're going to start with our friends who are all the way over back in Calgary. Robert Thirsk is going to go first. And we're going to let them make their way up to the microphone. Now, David, I'm looking at the things that you did in order to get there. A bachelor's degree in engineering, um, in engineering physics, a PhD in astrophysics, and a medical degree. Now, when you started that whole journey, did you, did you expect to, uh, to that's, that's a couple of years you've spent in education. You're right. I mean, that's, uh, I guess I like school very much and, uh, knowledge is my hobby i would say uh, and for me it's just being strung on uh, one after the other i train as an engineer like my father and my grandfather and i worked as an engineer for a couple of years uh pay off my debts and then i got a scholarship to do a phd and i went on to, back to university to become a, a scientist a physicist an astrophysicist and i worked as an astronomer a couple of years and then uh, for various reasons i decided my vocation was uh, to go to med school and uh, having uh, collected some money and got some scholarships, I was able to uh, pay my way through that. And I worked as a physician up in the Arctic in Canada for a couple of years. And that's when I heard that, the, that they were recruiting astronauts. And, you know, space had always been a fantasy for me as a child, a fascination. Uh, but honestly, it was never a project. I never thought it was possible to be an astronaut. But it did, it did get into my mind that... I had such respect for space and for astronauts that I always thought, you know, I'm going to try to be the same kind of person that I thought astronauts were. And that meant to me as a child that I was going to stay fit. I was going to go to university, go to school, go to university. I was going to learn foreign languages. I was going to travel. I was going to try to become an explorer, a modern day explorer, a mixture of an adventurer and a scientist. And that's what I had managed to do through education. Um, but when I heard they were recruiting astronauts, it's like I heard the voice of a small boy, the voice of me when I was six, uh, telling me, oh, David, you, you got to try. Please try. At least apply. Otherwise, you'll never know. Brilliant. All right. Well, uh, David, we have some questions. We're going to go to our friends at Robert Thurskis first. Lakewood, make sure you're ready, because as soon as Robert Thursk is done, we're going to go to you, followed by St. Malachy's in New Brunswick, and then hop across the country to our friends at West Point. So let's go across now to Robert Thirsk. If you guys want to say hello and ask your question, go ahead. Hi, my name's Ira and I was wondering what was the toughest part of the training going to space and how did he overcome it? Okay, so very central question. So astronaut training is a strange activity because it's so varied. It is so varied. You know, in a way that is the biggest difficulty of the job is the fact that you have to be okay at so many things. You have to be good technically with your hands at repairing machines. You gotta be a decent pilot. You gotta be good physically strong to use the spacesuit. You gotta have good coordination, good stamina. You gotta have ability to speak in public to explain what you're doing. You gotta have good communication skills anyway, good a particular personality uh, to be living in close quarters with lots of people for months on end. Uh, you got to have a see also a, a kind of a, a comfort with making decisions and uh, being a leader when, when the situation call for it. So it's very, very varied and the training reflects that. We learn to fly, we learn to use a space suit, we learn to use Canadarm, uh, we learn emergency procedures, we learn a bit of space medicine, we learn a bit of aerospace engineering uh, we're in a lot of geology I'm learning to fly rockets and then the next day I'm learning to do CPR you know to resuscitate someone in uh, zero gravity it is so varied all around the world spend my time between Russia and the US and Canada and Japan and Europe <sighs> oh you gotta learn to speak Russian at the same time all of that it's that juggling I think that's the most difficult it's keeping your head cool and focusing on the task at hand and not panic because there's so much left to do. Just do what you have on your plate right now and think about the rest later. So to me, that's the biggest technical challenge is to maintain that focus and not be distracted by the huge amount of work ahead of you. But on a personal level, you know what's the most difficult thing is that I'm a father and I'm a husband 
And all of that means I have to spend a lot of time away from them, away from the people that I love most. And juggling that with my spouse, with my kids, making sure this works well and nobody's suffering from it. But on the contrary, people are growing and it's a good experience for everybody. That I think is uh, the most uh, ch challenging thing personally is to maintain the balance because I've learned early in life that if I geek out and don't do only one thing, if all I am is an astronaut and I forget about being a father and a friend and a husband, I won't be as good an astronaut as I can be. The only way I can be the best astronaut I can be is if I keep everything in balance in my life. And that's the biggest challenge. Great question, Robert Thurston Calgary. Thanks for offering that. Now let's hop across to our friends in Ontario at Lakewood Elementary in Port Dover. Port Dover, over to you. My question for you is, if you could change anything in the world or in space, what would it be and why? Ah, if I could change anything in the world. Well, so our world, planet is a beautiful place, a wonderful place. And humans are great people. But as you know, we are constantly challenged with conflict and the difficulty of working together across different cultures. And to me, uh, space is one of those few arenas where humans work well together. We went through the Cold War working together. Right now, if you look at Space Station, it's built by 16 nations, most of which used to fight wars a couple generations ago. But now we work together in space. I think space has that magic ability to make humans rise, get wiser, get better, and work together. Because from space, it's obvious that we're in the same boat. Our boat is planet Earth, our spacecraft. We're all astronauts on planet Earth going through the cosmos. So if I could change one thing, it would be I would like to accelerate time because I think as time goes by, humans will work better and better together. There will be fewer and fewer conflicts. We will end up being just Earthlings uh, all on the same boat. And we'll realize this thanks to space exploration. So this is dear to my heart. And I think your generation is better than my generation of that. My generation was better than the previous generation of that. We, every generation that goes by, we become more and more members of just the human race and we get more and more used to working with people who are different from us. And I think that's the beauty, one of the beauties of the space program. Absolutely, that's so amazing. What a power, that's a great question. Uh, well done, Lakewood Elementary. Okay, now we're gonna go a little farther to the east. And we're gonna say hello to our friends who are joining us from St. Malachy's in uh, all the way over in New Brunswick. Go ahead, New Brunswick. All right, uh, well, we just wanted to ask what role will optics and visualization technology play in our future understanding or exploration of the universe? Ah, optics and like virtual reality, you mean? Or, like uh, telescope imaging and uh, of course, uh, yeah. new technology like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so right now, uh, this is the astronomer talking, you know, uh, we haven't reached the limits of uh, our ability to see using telescopes uh, with interferometry. We can make these virtual giant telescopes uh, by putting together several small telescopes millions of miles away from each other. So I think we haven't reached the end of that. I think. Uh, the day will come sooner we will make an image of another planet around another star and that will be eye-opening when we actually see not indirect evidence of other planets but direct images of another planet around another star where we might that might harbor life i think that is that that is an exploration that's kind of our our secret hope that maybe we can find other thinking beings out there and uh, astronomy is going to be our, uh, our first step to that. Great question. I, obviously asked by a couple of scientists. Yes. Uh, well, well stated, New Brunswick. Okay, we're going to fly all the way across the country to our friends in West Point Grey in Vancouver, British Columbia. BC, over to you. I think you're on mute. Oh, look at that. I had there. <laughs> it's my mistake. Okay, let's go one more time. British Columbia, over to you. Hi, um, my name is Kalei. And my question was, I read about, um, you met Steve McLean and 
um, the advice he gave you and how it, it really changed your career. Um, I was wondering, other than that advice he gave you, what would you give to a student hoping to pursue engineering or just science in general? Wow, yes, yeah. so this is a powerful uh, element. Um, so as I said in my introduction, I really think our youth is our future, uh, but that treasure that resides in your minds, in your heads, you, the young people of Canada, that treasure can only be unleashed by you. And you have to decide that it is your right to try and to be the best you can be. You, you, and the only way you can be the best you can be, frankly, is if you do something you love. Because without love, you will never find the energy to be the best you can be. And that actually sounds easy to do, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult to listen to that little voice and actually have the humility to say, you know, despite what everybody else thinks or everybody tells me, this is what I want to do, honestly. Uh, and it takes, uh, it takes courage, uh, but you can work at it every day. You're very young, all of you, and it's not too early to start to take steps in the direction of your dream. A dream is just, to me, a dream is like the North Star. It's a, it's a light that's so far away, maybe you'll never get there, but it is your guide. It's what helps you to get in motion. And while you're wrong is when you have to start to get in motion before, if you don't do, if you don't decide what to do with yourself every day, someone else will, someone else will give you an order. Someone else will tell you what to do. And that's just too bad. Why not decide for yourself? So you all have a dream somewhere, a little voice, pay attention and uh, listen to it. And don't be afraid of your dream. Yeah, actually. If it's big and scary, that's an even better dream. <laughs> that's great advice. Exactly. The sky's the, I mean, the sky's the limit, even beyond the sky's the limit, right? When we come to some and, of these you know, dreams. But what, what's important is that you shouldn't be obsessed with reaching the destination. Mm. The power of your dream is that it sets you in motion. It puts you on a path and then something happens. Then you grow, you develop, you meet people. And then maybe you'll turn away, you'll turn around, you'll change direction, who cares? Your dream is what allowed you to move, to get moving and to grow. So don't be afraid of your dream. Don't be thinking, oh, it's too crazy. I'm not gonna even try. No, 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 that would be the worst mistake to not even try. Brilliant. All right, well, Robert, we, uh, David, we have some questions that are coming in from, uh, from some school, a school in Okotoks who's watching this on, uh, on YouTube Live. And they said, uh, what was your training like to prepare for your mission? Okay, so training has been going on for me for, you know, almost a decade now. Uh, when I started, when I became a, a junior astronaut, a candidate astronaut for two years, uh, you're like on probation and you have to get your license if you want. So we start to get the basics, basic spacesuit training, uh, robotics training, that's in Canada, uh, basic space station systems, procedures, uh, and a lot of Russian language training and of course, general fitness and learning to fly. I didn't have much experience flying. A lot of astronauts are professional pilots. I was not, so I have to learn to become a pilot. So all of that was a lot of work. And then once you got your license as an astronaut, then you can start on more advanced training. And a lot of that training is on the job. So I spent many years working in mission control as a radio operator to talk to space station. And that way I was, you know, in that huge team of people working behind the scenes, making sure that space missions uh, are successful. We all know the astronaut's face, but that's just the most visible person in, the, in this huge team, tens of thousands of people working hard to make sure space missions are, uh, are successful. So that's for several years, that's what I was doing, working in the background. And then when I got assigned to my own mission, finally, because for astronauts, it's very rare. Most of your career is spent on the ground helping other astronauts' uh, missions. And once or twice, if you're lucky, it'll be your turn to have a mission. But most of our career, we're there helping others. So when I got assigned, wow, uh, then things changed mode a little bit. Then I only focused on very advanced training, very specific training. Spent a lot of my time, about half my time in the last two years in Russia, learning uh, to fly the Soyuz rocket, because I'll be the co-pilot of that Soyuz. That will, uh, um, Take me to, sorry, I got a message here. Okay, they're gonna take me to space. Are you there yet? Yes, okay. And, uh, and then I got learn all these science experiments that we'll do on space because that is the purpose of the mission is to be six months on the space station doing science experiments. Most of the experiments, especially those that are sponsored by Canada are medically 
basically in the realm of medicine or biomedical sciences. And as a physician, that's uh, very exciting to me. So it's a, it's a big plate. It's a mouthful, but you take it uh, one, one, one piece at a time. Excellent. Thank you. Great question, Westmount School in Okotoks, Alberta. Let's actually stick in Alberta. Back to our friends at Robert Thirsk High School. Uh, they get to have a follow-up question. So Robert Thirst will get you to make your way up to the microphone and ask the question that you have for uh, David Sejac. Go ahead, Robert Thirst. Hi, my name is Jihad. And the, my question is, what new opportunities does the privatization of the space industry bring? And what does it lose from government-funded programs? So, you know, there's many, uh, many ways to ask, answer this question. First, commercial space is coming. It, there's no question, it will happen. Just like uh, air travel uh, started as a government adventure, risk, too risky for business, and then it became a business. Now, nowadays, you know, we go on our cell phone, we buy a plane ticket to cross the Atlantic, we just show up at the airport, and here we are sitting at 33,000 feet eating peanuts, not thinking about it. And that's been because technology has made it possible for the, to be part of daily life. And that's really what commercialization means. It's when technology becomes so well controlled, it's part of our daily life. And that will happen to space. Space flight will be something humans do routinely. It's not there yet, though, where it's still the most dangerous thing that we do, and we have to be very, very careful about it. But certainly what the commercialization of space brings to us uh, is new ideas, uh, new ways of, uh, of doing business. And it brings also, uh, if you want, a, um, a, a new, new reasons to explore. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, companies get into it if there's a, a practical reason, maybe mining, maybe uh, colonization. So we'll see uh, where this takes us. But we've had commercial entities in the space program ever since the beginning of the space program. You know, Boeing made the space shuttle. Lockheed made the moon rockets. Uh, the space station is built by a consortium of uh, aerospace companies. So it's not new, the relationship between uh, government entities and, uh, and commercial sector in space. It's just taking a new twist these days. And I hope Canada jumps in the, that bandwagon. Brilliant. Great question, Robert Thirst. Uh, let's go across now to our friends again in Port Dover, uh, Lakewood Elementary School. Do you have a follow-up question for, uh, for David St. Jacques? One second, there we go. And we're ready for you. Go ahead. We have a couple of quick questions, one in English and a couple in French. Okay. How scared are you to go up in space? How scared are you to go up in space? Go ahead. Very central question. You know, of course, I'm, I would be I would be a fool if I wasn't scared. It's dangerous, right? It's a, it's really dangerous. But what do you do when you have to do something dangerous? What you do is you prepare, you train, you practice, you look at your equipment and you trust other people who are also part of the team. So I have full confidence in the thousands of technicians and engineers who are building the rocket safely. And my job is to know my procedures, know my theory and know my operations well. So I prepare well and that way I don't feel like we're running a great risk. It is dangerous, but we can minimize the risk by being ready. Parfait. Et maintenant, on a des questions en français. Alors, à nos étudiants en Ontario, est-ce que euh, vous voulez demander votre question? Bonjour. Bonsoir. Oh, uh, un moment. Excuse. OK. Alors. OK. Okay, I'll see. Bonjour, je m'appelle Marley. J'aime le plus dans votre travail. Qu'est-ce que j'aime le plus dans mon travail? Oui. Oui, alors, bonjour. Ce que j'aime le plus dans mon travail, euh, c'est qu'il est très varié. Moi, il y a beaucoup de choses que j'aime dans la vie. Euh, j'aime le travail physique, j'aime le travail intellectuel, j'aime les relations avec les autres. Et j'ai tout ça dans mon travail d'astronaute. Parce que c'est euh, 
un travail physique, c'est un travail intellectuel et c'est aussi un travail d'équipe. Et c'est ça que j'aime le plus dans ce travail. J'aime aussi la chance que j'ai de pouvoir communiquer mon aventure avec vous, de pouvoir aussi partager tout ce que j'apprends. J'ai appris beaucoup grâce à mon travail d'astronaute. Et c'est pour moi, c'est un peu l'avenir. C'est un des, une des choses par lesquelles qui va aider l'humanité à se sortir de ses problèmes, c'est l'espace. Et j'aime toujours parler avec des jeunes pour vous expliquer pourquoi l'espace, c'est important pour votre avenir. Hmm. Um, that's a great. Now let's go to our second question in French that we have. Uh, the, uh, that was it. Yeah, go ahead because we know you had a second one there. Okay, and then we're gonna. Then our time is almost done together. My goodness, we're down to our last couple of minutes. And so, if Beakerhead wants to let us know if they want to say anything to close things off, but we're gonna go first off to our friends in uh, in um, Lakewood uh, pour la deuxième question en français. Allons-y. Encore une autre fois, s'il vous plaît. Allez. Pourquoi je veux... Pourquoi je veux voyager dans l'espace? Bien. Je vais, je vais dire pourquoi, pour moi, c'est important, l'espace. Euh, D'abord, on fait de la recherche scientifique et médicale très importante dans l'espace. Et ça, pour moi... C'est euh, l'avenir. C'est notre avenir, c'est la science, c'est la connaissance. Ça, c'est un élément. Le deuxième élément, c'est que le, le programme de l'espace spatial, ça amène tous les pays à travailler ensemble. Et je pense que l'avenir de l'humanité passe par la collaboration entre les nations. Et l'espace, c'est un bel exemple de ce qu'on peut faire quand on travaille ensemble tous les pays du monde. Et troisièmement, l'espace... Aller dans l'espace, c'est comme sortir de notre maison pour la regarder. Et c'est grâce à l'espace qu'on a pris conscience que notre planète, elle est belle, mais elle est fragile. Hein, maintenant, on fait attention à la planète, on fait attention à l'environnement, on pense de manière globale à toute la Terre, et ça, c'est grâce à l'espace. Alors, ça, c'est la troisième raison pourquoi euh, c'est important pour moi qu'on continue à faire de l'exploration spatiale. Well, David, we are out of time. And I cannot believe how fast this half an hour has gone. Thank you so much to all of our brilliant schools. I think it's so exciting to have our whole country coming together from coast to coast to celebrate the work that you're doing, the work that Canada is doing, and the work that we can do as a planet. We're going to pass it back to our friends at Beakerhead, who made all of this possible in Calgary to close the event off. Beakerhead, over to you. Hi, I just want to say thank you all for joining and thank you, David, for taking the time. Um, he's 12 hours ahead of time for us, so he's closing out our, his day uh, by talking to us, but has to go to uh, get ready for training again tomorrow. So thanks again to our sponsors, uh, uh, Government of Alberta, NSERC, and Axia, and uh, good best of luck to you, David. Thank you. Thanks for doing this uh, for the youth of Canada. And all of you young people, believe in yourselves. Croyez en vous. You are our future. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Canada. Goodbye, British Columbia. Goodbye, Alberta. Goodbye, Ontario. Goodbye, New Brunswick. Have a good day, everyone. Au revoir. À bientôt. Bye-bye. Merci.